A couple more books for 1995, both related. Um, so this month we're covering the first of them with George and the Jedi from Barbara Hambly, and next month we have a sim sequel, Dark Saber from Kevin J. Anderson. George and the Jedi is set a few months after the events of the Jedi Academy trilogy and is written by Barbara Hambly. Hambly is an extremely prolific novelist. Her longest running series is her. Uh, Benjamin January Mysteries, based around a detective who was a free black man in New Orleans in the late 1830s. She's also been nominated for several Lucas Awards for other works of science fiction, and prior to the publication of this book, had also written several Star Trek novels, putting her alongside the late Vonda and McIntyre in terms of authors who have written for both Star Trek and Star Wars. Based on a few plot beats, I suspect this book was written before the Carillion Trilogy, as there is an implication that Lando and Mara Jade may be in a relationship, whereas in the Krillian trilogy, Lando is looking to get married and not to Mara. I'm not sure this is meant to be set before the Krillian trilogy in the timeline or not. Leia, Han, Chewie, and Luke have traveled to Ithor for diplomatic negotiations of an unspecified variety. While there, Leia and Han are attacked by Drubba McCum, a former smuggler colleague of Hans. McCumb warns of a threat against the planet of Belsavis and the Children of the Jedi, and against the Republic. Han and Leia decide to go to Belsavis to investigate his warning. Meanwhile, Luke works with Nikos, the fiancé of one of Luke's students at the Jedi Academy, Cray, to learn more. Nikos knows something of Belsavis as he spent some time there as a child. He also w was Force-sensitive, but several years previously, Cray used C. Rook technology to intact Nikos into a droid body after he was diagnosed with an incurable ter terminal illness. As a consequence, he's lost his fourth sensitivity. Nikos uses random number generation, influenced by his memories, to generate some coordinates. Luke decides to follow them, accompanied by Cray, Nikos, and C-3PO, while R2-D2 goes with Leia and Han. Luke and Kray end up following the coordinates to a massive mobile battleship called the Eye of Palpatine. The ship was sent on a secret wish mission to wipe out the Jedi settlement on Belsavis towards the tail end of the Clone Wars. The planned mission was to pick up several stormtrooper garrisons from a series of worlds before going to Belsavis. These trooper garrisons were just basically planted in the middle of nowhere and told to wait for pickup. The Eye of Palpatine is no human crew, just an array of droids and a droid intelligence called the Will. Instead, the only other living beings aboard are what were picked up in place of the planned stormtrooper garrisons who have since either all died or been transferred elsewhere. These are include Jawas, Tusken Raiders, and various other races of the uh, Star Wars universe. However, something had disrupted the ship's mission back when it was originally constructed before finally being restarted now, years after the end of the war, the, the fall of the Empire. Kray and Nikos end up being separated from Luke and 3PO and are captured by one of the factions on board the ship. Luke and 3PO set out to find the truth of what happened years ago and rescue Kray and Nikos. 
Over the course of Luke's exploration of the Eye of Palpatine, he learned that the ship was sabotaged as part of an earlier mission by a Jedi Knight named Callista. However, the, the effort left her mortally wounded, and in an attempt to try and keep the ship from being reactivated, she used the Force to transfer her consciousness to the ship's main computer. As Luke and Callista try to put together a plan of action to stop the ship once and for all, the two fall in love. Ultimately, they find a way to rescue Nikos and Kray, reach the self-destruct controls for the Eye of Palpatine, and set the ship to blow. In the process, Nikos is badly damaged, and Kray decides to use the Force to swap places with her spirit and Callista's. Kray in the ship's computer, Callista's in her in Kray's physical body, so Kray can stay with her fiancé while Callista can be with Luke. Meanwhile, on Belsavis, Han and Leia learn about a long-running smuggling operation shipping electronic components out of ruins on the planet. The operation suddenly dried up after the Battle of Endor. This leads Han and Leia to go on an expert investigation into why. The cause seems related to Roganda Ismarin, a member of the Emperor's court who ended up with the planet. Han and Leia learn that Roganda has worked with her son, Eric, who can control electronic brains using the Force. Eric had taken control of the Eye of Palpatine and had forced it to restart its mission. Roganda has told the noble houses of this Senex Juvex cluster that Eric is the child of her and Emperor Palpatine. This is not actually the truth. He is her child, but not Palpatine's. With Eric's power and the power of their warship, they would be able to form a new empire with the houses in positions of power and influence within it. As part of this investigation, Han and Leia also learned that Roganda is another of the Emperor's hands. Han and Leia contact Mara Jade, they've been contacting her off and on over the course of this investigation, and let her know about Roganda as they are planning to leave when they are captured by Roganda's allies. Han and Leia fight their way off planet, make their way to the Falcon, and get into orbit around the same time the Eye of Palpatine jumps into the system. And then at that point, the Eye of Palpatine launches a whole bunch of escape pods and then blows up. The Falcon rescues Luke and Callista and rendezvous with Mara Jade. Mara reports that Roganda and Arik has have fled the system as fast as their ship can go. Meanwhile, Luke and Callista are overjoyed that they're reunited in the flesh, but Callista, however, is shocked and somewhat horrified to learn that as a consequence, she's lost her Force sensitivity. The book travels to the planet of Belsophis, a mostly icy world with a whole bunch of tropical valleys heated by volcanic vents. We learn in this book the identity of a second emperor's hand, Roganda Ismarin. We're introduced to the Senex Juvix cluster, along with the cluster's political system, that they are ruled by a collection of noble houses. After learning about the planet Ithor from Tales of the Mos Eisley Cantina, we get to go there for the first time. We learn a whole bunch about Gamorrean society, and they're basically written by, like, proud but dumb warrior race guy orcs. Research in Sirik technology has developed to enough of a degree that a person's consciousness could be voluntarily intact into a human droid ta chassis, but there's still a long way to go before this technology could be medically accepted. This book is kind of a mess. The problem is, the Han and Leia and the Luke and Kray plot threads aren't intertwined well enough. In Empire, while the gang is separated in the second act of the film, they ultimately reunite in the third act, and their actions mesh very much cohes cohesively in that portion of the film. Um, even if like Luke and Leia aren't fighting alongside now, they reunite, and the actions between the two, um, the, the, the others have done over the course of their arc of the film, relate to each other and tie into each other directly. In Return of the Jedi, while our heroes split apart in the third act, they're together for the first two. And the actions in the first two acts, of course, have their impacts on the third. In Children of the Jedi, they split very early in the first act. And, well, not very early, but they split early in the first act, and but they only reunite in the denouement. The climax happens unconnected from each other, basically. I mean, 
there are there is a little bit of impact. The closer the eye of Palpatine gets to Belsavis, the more danger Lay and Han are in. But that's about it for in terms of the impact of that plot. And the opponents, the opposition, the antagonists of the Eye of Palpatine plot are responsible for, or, or not, not for the Eye of Palpatine plot, but from the Belsavis plot, are responsible for the activation of the Eye of Palpatine and approaching Belsavis. And so in terms of that impacts Luke and Prey and Callista's arc. Further, as the mystery on Belsavis shifts from where are the children of the Jedi to what happened to the smuggling operation and why did that happen to the smuggling operation, while the focus of the ship Peril Thif shifts, there's still a degree of threat that is entirely focused on Belsavis and has no impact on the Eye of Palpatine. Now, someone trying to restore the Empire could do some serious damage with the Eye of Palpatine, but the lack of communication between the two sides negates some of that build, because the Eye of Palpatine's in horrible shape. Um, I don't get into this much in the synopsis, but one of the things that comes up repeatedly over the course of the book is the Eye of Palpatine is not really a functioning warship. Like, the will is, has an ability to enforce control over these various disparate groups that have been picked up in place of the Stormtrooper garrisons it's supposed to get, but they are no way acting, way, acting like Stormtrooper garrisons. The Gamma, the there's two Gamorrean tribes that have been picked up. You know, at the same time, Luke, Callista, and well, the same time that Luke and Cray are, and they hate each other. And basically, a last portion of the book has them fighting over different chunks of the ship. They the ship has previously visited Tatooine, and there are Jawas on the ship, and they've been tearing the the ship apart. And the ship is not only not aware of it, or if, if they are aware, it's not taking any action, which also should, in theory, impact the plot in terms of the more sensitive kid who's who has knows the schematics of the Eye of Palpatine and can use that to manipulate the ship and draw it to him on Belsavis, because changing the schematic of a thing impacts his ability to control it. One of the things that comes up is the guy tears to take advantage of R2-D2 because he's with um, Leia and Han. You use him to kill them. And Chewbacca fixes his um, fixes him up differently and as opposed to according to the schematics which is how the, Re the rebel text fixed him after Endor. And that is enough of a shift where he can't control R2. Presumably, if you were writing this book after, uh, not even, didn't, didn't even after, if you were writing this book with 3PO having been with um, Leia and Han, um, you could have a, a, a plot point being that 3PO starts acting wonky, but and, and acting like he's trying to to cause problems for them, but he's not actually able to do so, and have that be because his schematics are weird because he got shot apart on uh, on Cloud City and then put back together by Chewbacca with what was a, with what is handy and available, not necessarily according to schematics, but because he's Chewbacca is resourceful and he's working with what he's got and that sort of thing. Honestly, I think the story builds suspense more strongly, or would build suspense more strongly, if the characters were more aware of the rising tension. Even if they don't have complete information to let them know in full why tension is rising. Um, this comes up with Luke and uh, Ray and Callista, because they know that the Eye of Palpatine is moving towards its end objective, and when it gets there, 
bad things are going, in theory, going to happen. Leia and Han don't know where the Palpatine is, on the other hand, so they don't have that ticking clock. And it'd be nice if they had some awareness of the ticking clock, or had a, an opportunity to get awareness of that ticking clock. Maybe through um, Mara Jade being more active in the story, playing, more, playing a more active role and passing along information, maybe having it start to, the ship start to show up on the on near public um, surveillance nets and that sort of thing. Maybe even have it take out a couple small scout ships or something, just to kind of set up. Hey, it is still pretty dangerous, and if you try to fly up to it, approach it, it's not necessarily going to go well for you. The defenses are still active, something like that. That said. There are other elements of this plot where it, it under the book undercuts itself in a lot of really stupid ways. Here's a great example. Palpatine built a massive, or had built rather, didn't build himself. He had built a massive AI-controlled warship. He sent a ton of stormtroopers across the cosmos with or orders to wait for pickup, nothing else, on these out-of-the-way, nowhere outposts. The plan was then for this ship, under its automated control, AI yeah, control, to travel to these coordinates, pick up the troopers, and then attack a civilian outpost. And then Palpatine goes and builds the Death Star, which was designed to just blow up planets. Not crack the crust a little bit. Like we saw, like we did, we, we can do that. We saw that happen in, we see that happen later in Rogue One, but we can really be soon, you can turn it down to low and just crack the crust of the planet and render it uninhabitable that way, or temporarily uninhabitable that way, and to just blowing it right the hell up. And this is without getting into, oh, and then also after the Death Star, of course, is destroyed, his response is, Let's build a bigger one. And this is without getting into the comics with the Galaxy Gun. Or getting into the Ma installation from the Tales of the Jedi Academy trilogy with the Sun Crusher. In other words, the whole Eye of Palpatine plot is way is way too convoluted and sub convoluted with too many things that can go wrong, and in fact have already gone wrong, compared to, I'm going to build a really big gun, a massive death ray, with which to destroy my enemies. Now yes, the later EU does show Palpatine is capable of devious plans, like how he turned down against the Stark side, or all the steps leading into Order 66. But this plan... With, with the Eye of Palpatine, doesn't mesh with either side of, Pal uh, of the Emperor. The Emperor, who never met a superweapon plan that he didn't like, doesn't feel like the person who would shy away from just cracking the crust of Belsavis to take care of a sufficiently entrenched Jedi settlement and over sending in infantry to deal with the situation. Or even, for that matter, parking a bunch of Star Destroyers in orbit and just bombarding the crap out of the place before sending in Stormtroopers. as a mopping up operation. Just blast the place until it's superheated, let the ice cool it, and then come on in and then kill anything that's left. That would be just as much as Emperor's speed. Similarly, the more patient hunting plotter, who would be responsible for wiping out the Jedi and turning Anakin Skywalker to the dark side, would also be patient enough to wait until they could do that plan, until they could op move openly against Belsavis. Particularly since they're far enough out on the periphery that an open show of force wouldn't cause any major problems. We're not in the core. We're not among Coruscant or any of those other worlds nor are we in any of the more populous rim planets like Nar Shaddaa. We're not even in the outskirts of Tatooine where 
where you drop in a battalion of stormtroopers and somebody's going to see something whether you like it or not. That sort of thing. I'm not the kind of guy who makes a big thing about plot holes. I am recognize that character motivations can be strange and arbitrary because um, or just not necessarily what we think of with like what a normal person would do because also because from how I read fiction as a person with autism, a lot of people in real life, I perceive their motivations and their actions as being somewhat arbitrary. But so long as in fiction the, their actions are internally consistent with themselves, I am cool with that. Um, but this doesn't, this isn't internally consistent with either of the aspects of Palpatine. Not the devious plotter who brought down the Republic from within and just led to the destruction of the Jedi, nor the scenery-chewing uber-villain who shops at the same tailor as Ming the Merciless, has an array of clones with which to transfer his consciousness to in the event of his death, and is has just a nice big binder on his shelf full of super weapon designs um, waiting to be popped out in a Roman, moment's notice. It doesn't fit with either of those concepts, and also those two concepts are still internally consistent with each other, because the devious plotter is what you are when you can't just let your true self out and be and go full Ming, and then once you run the show, whatever you can go tromping into your um um your throne room in your high colored dark evil overlord robe and direct the person who's failed you onto a um under the hidden trap door while it'll be dropped into a pit of piranhas. We'll get into that with Darksaber. Um, you can do both of those things. But this way too convoluted, too many things that could possibly go wrong, that's not the plot that doesn't fit with either concept of Palpatine. And it doesn't work with the Imperial Warlords, with the other Imperial Admirals we've met either. I could see this plan being the kind of thing that a ambitious Imperial Admiral would come up with to try and curry favor with the Emperor. But I also couldn't see that Admiral, Admiral having the resources to pull it off on their own, nor being able to persuade the Emperor to go for it. Ron would be absolutely in favor of more of the direct military result, assault, but and as opposed to using a tactic like we have in the book, which leaves way, way too much up for chance, which is why it fails. Um, there's no human crew on the Eye of Palpatine to handle repairs. Um, part of the reason why Callista is able to get inside and get her consciousness transferred into the ship is because there isn't a human crew, there's only a droid crew in opposition to her. And I'm certain that that's, that's the kind of thing where Thrawn would be like, no, a saboteur could get in and the droids could be fooled it easily for programming in a way that would allow the saboteur to do tremendous things to undermine the plan. Grim off Tarkin, Tarkin just don't care. Um, Tarkin's all about the big, grand gesture. And the subtlety, or the, the overly convoluted it's not exactly subtle because you're still ultimate. I mean, you're still ultimately attacking the the place with a garrison with a battalion of stormtroopers and an orbital bombardment. So the overly convoluted elements of the Eye of Palpatine plan doesn't fit with what Tarkin would do. But at least since Tarkin is a champion of the Death Star plan at this point in the expanded universe, so he'd be like, oh. after we've. Got the Death Star up and running. Let's just swing by Belsavis and... And if he didn't have the Death Star, you're like, okay. There's um, the asteroid belt. We'll just chuck rocks on it. Um, Just kinetic weapon drops. Do that. Vader would want to do it himself. Vader would. Vader is a hands-on guy. Vader's like, oh, I'm, I'm personally going to go down there and carve up all these Jedi 
and the younglings and make sure they're dead firsthand. Warlord Zinji, um, who we met in Courtship of Princess Leia, wouldn't care. Like, in the sense that he'd actually not bother with this because the planet's not a strategic military importance. Um, he gets nothing out of it. It's the same reason, like, with, in Courtship of Princess Leia, his response to the Night Sisters at the Thomir was, we're just going to, like, the, the Emperor's got them imprisoned on this planet so they can't get out and wreck havoc. That's a good plan. Let's leave it at that. Just leave it at that. Leave them down the down on there, and that works exactly. That fits with what I'm doing already, and it's no more sweat off my back. Admiral Dalla would probably split the difference between Thrawn and Tarkin. Direct military attack, but one that would probably involve big grand gesture orbital bombardments and that sort. Of. Probably the one recurring Imperial antagonist who would pull him up with a plan as overly convoluted as this one. Is one who we haven't met yet. I'm going to jump the timeline here in terms of the, the book publication order because we're going to meet her soon. That's Hassan Isard of Imperial Intelligence. Even then, she'd have some sort of insurance policy to try to make sure that the plan went off on schedule, like a skeleton crew of indoctrinated officers aboard the ship or something. So it it's two plots that are incredibly dependent on each other but barely make contact and don't fit in well with the rest of the universe. And it makes the story weaker than the sum of its parts. There are bits I like. The whirlwind romance of Luke and Callista is nice. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm interested in revisiting where that ends up going. Because I read Darksaber before I read Church of the Jedi. Originally. But as the structure around it is concerned, it doesn't hold up. Oh, I, I, I like... Han and Leia on Belsavis and that investigation. I enjoy a science fiction sort of suspense thriller mystery thing going on, and I like the idea of, like, this is a better version of the fake air of Palpatine plot than the one that we get in the retconned out of existence 70s and 80s YA novels with Triclops, which is the reason why I didn't touch those. I mean 70s, but 80s YA novels with Triclops. Because the reason why I don't touch those is, yes, they republished them with Drew Suizan, um Suizan cover art, but they're bad. Everyone ignores them. And they have no further impact on the larger Star Wars expanded universe. So that can go away. I can ignore it. But otherwise, what is more interesting about this book is less what happens here and more the potential of what can bear fruit later. And we'll see how effective later authors are at picking up what this book lays down or if they just decide to go, no, nothing really useful came out of this book. We can ignore it. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>